Good morning, beloved. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord to celebrate this second Advent Sunday together as we worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. For we come during this Advent season to be reminded of that God Himself took on flesh to dwell among us, to live that life that we can never live, obedience to the law, to die that death that we deserve, that sinner's death under the full wrath of God. And yet, as sinners and as people of God, we are forgiven and all of our judgments have been cast upon the Lord Himself. And so we come as a people who are ready to sing praises, who are ready to return thanks, who are ready to worship our Lord, for He has done marvelous things in the life of His people. He has guided and sustained. He has spoken through His Word and by His Spirit. And He continues to do so even to this day. And we are thankful. And so we are here to worship. I want to uh, draw your attention to our announcement page on uh, page 13 of your bulletin. Please uh, be reminded that all of our announcements are important within the life of the church. And there's many there for you to draw your attention to. But I want to highlight two uh, that are not in your bulletin. Please be reminded that there's a congregational meeting for the purpose of uh, hearing uh, the budgets uh, from the session immediately following the morning uh, worship service. And so uh, immediately after the postlude, uh, Ruling Elder Jim Atkins with our missions committee and Ruling Elder Roger Sloan with our administration and finance committee uh, will present those budgets to you as information. Remember, as a congregation, you will need to vote on uh, my call and so we'll entertain that motion during that congregational meeting as well. And so please be reminded of those things. Immediately after the postlude, uh, we'll have our congregational meeting uh, for the purpose of the budgets. Uh, and if you are not a member and you would like to be ex uh, excused, please be excused during that postlude time. Also, tithing envelopes are prepared for the 2021 year. And so if you um, are serving as an officer of the church session, uh, diaconate, or uh, women's Council, your, uh, your tithing envelopes are in your box uh, in the hallway downstairs, but if you are not serving in a leadership capacity of the church, your tithing envelopes are ready for you at the back of the church, and so you can uh, receive them uh, as you leave, and we would be uh, most grateful that you do so. Our call to worship uh, this morning comes from God's Word in Isaiah chapter 9. If you have your own copies of God's Word or you would like to use a pew Bible, we're reading uh, verses 2 through 7 of Isaiah chapter 9. And this is a well-known Advent Christmas text. The prophet writes, speaking on behalf of the Lord, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spool. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Indeed, as we come into the courts of our Lord to worship our Lord together, it is good for us to sing. And so, as you are able, let's stand and sing that first hymn of praise. As with gladness, men of old, we're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. 1, 4, and 5. Let's stand together and sing.
Hallelujah to you, that we can praise your name because we've been reconciled by the, the blood, the redemption that is in your Son. We've been brought near. We've been delivered and transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son. For that we give thanks. And our Heavenly Father, we come this morning to worship you. Father, this Christmas season we praise you. Uh, we thank you that you're a loving God who sent your Son into the world to redeem sinners, to adopt us and bring us into your family. So, Father, we come as children. We come by the power, and by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, and we come in the name of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is printed in your bulletin on page two. We have two questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism that we will, uh, I will ask the question, then we all together will respond with the answer. And we'll, we'll see that this morning, we, as we focus on the Christ child during this time of the year, we focus on the one and only redeemer of anybody, of God's elect. But there is a redeemer. We'll see that in number 21. And then finally, the incarnation, that the eternal son of God uh, became a man and, and how it is that he did that. So again, printed on page two in your bulletin, uh, I will ask the question and then we will all respond together. So question is, who is the redeemer of God's elect? The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God, became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. How did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin. Please be seated. Now, if Matt McCall and his family would please come forward now for the lighting of the Advent wreath. on to our next 
uh, hymn of preparation, which is number 218 in the hymn, Trinity hymnal, but it's on page six, uh, Angels from the Realms of Glory. And I want to remind us that it's during this hymn that the children will be dismissed for children's church. So if you have a child uh, from K3 through first grade and you would like them to go to children's church during this time, uh, they will be dismissed to the back of the church. Um, they are welcome to stay, but they are also uh, free to go. So we will actually stand for this hymn uh, together. Again, we will, re we will sing uh, Angels from the Realms of Glory, printed on page 6. <laughs> God, and thou hast spoken worlds into being by your power. Lord, thou art God of steadfast love and joy and peace and goodness and kindness and patience and gentleness. Lord, we confess our sins before you and ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, your son, who you have given, Lord, to 
suffer for our sins. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, that's been faithful to you these last 120 years. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming here on the Lord's Day, morning and evening, to hear the gospel preached. We thank you for a prayer meeting where we can go and, Lord, you said we have not because we ask not. We thank you for the privilege to support our uh, missionaries all around the world, our church plants and our Christian schools and, and seminaries. Lord, we ask your protection on us, Lord, and as this epidemic uh, surrounds us. Lord, we pray for our Advent services coming up, Lord, this morning and on through this month, Lord. We particularly remember our Christmas Eve service, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray we would honor you this morning, Lord, with our preaching and our prayers and our singing. Lord, forgive us for our sins as a nation, Lord. We pray for you, you to send revival, Lord, for that is our hope. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Take your Bibles in your hands and turn with me to Luke chapter 1. If you're using the bulletin, that's on page 4. Feel free to use one of those pew Bibles as you feel comfortable. But we're looking at Luke chapter 1, starting in the 39th verse. Through this Advent season, we are looking at prob probably what we believe, I hope that we believe, is the greatest story ever told, and that's the birth of Jesus. And Last week, we looked at the visit from the angel to Mary to tell the young virgin girl that she was going to bear a son and that his name would be Jesus and that he is that promised Messiah from old. And as we saw Mary willfully and obediently submit herself to the will of God, we now see her journeying to her cousin Elizabeth's home and then singing praises to her Lord with the Magnificat, as we so rightly call it. And so we're going to read Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39, and reading all the way through the end of that Magnificat, verse 56. Verse 39 through verse 56. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. The grass withers, the flower 
fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. Even before I started preparing for this sermon, I saw a social media post from a ministry colleague that forced my two church worlds to collide. He said that Mary's Magnificat blends together a rich Reformed covenant theology with Pentecostal praise. For it stimulates the mind, stirs the hearts, and makes one shout in worship. Here it is that these two things that I love and cherish, my background being raised in the church and raised in a Christian home, has collided with the rich Reformed theology that I hold so dear to my heart. Now, I'll admit to you, the first time that I read that social media post, I chuckled a bit because, let's be frank, Presbyterianism and Pentecostalism aren't usually used in one sentence together. They're not utilized as we talk about these traditions together, but but the more I thought about it, it really had me thinking about what the scene here is showing us. Because here is Mary, here is a teenage girl who has just been told that she will be the mother of the Messiah. She will be the one who will carry the Christ child. The one that has so long been anticipated. The one that has for so long been promised. And, and here is Mary and what we call a beautiful story being told by the angel and now the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaping for joy at the presence of the Savior. It's a beautiful story for us, but I think that oftentimes we forget that this is quite a difficult story for Mary. Because here is Mary who is a virgin. Mary who is now an unwed mother. Who is now facing being excluded from her community. Being excluded from her religion. Being excluded from her husband. For we even know through other gospel writers that these are the things that she was facing. And it even took the same angel visiting Joseph for him not to divorce her. And so all of these, all of these despairing facts, despairing accounts are being faced by this young virgin Mary. And yet, in the face of those circumstances... Mary pours out this, this powerful song of praise. A, a, a Pentecostal shout, if you will. She pours out this song of praise to her God despite the circumstances. And I think it forces us to consider how we would respond in trying circumstances like this. I know that we aren't the ones who are now being promised that we would carry the cross child, but in this fallen world, we encounter circumstances that, that take our breath away, that, that lead us to, to operate on autopilot, as we will see, that give us no time to think or consider our reactions, but will force us to react in a certain way. And and here it is, I think, that Mary's song of praise teaches us a handful of lessons on how to, how to react to these difficult circumstances in this fallen world. And so, if you're taking notes, that first thing I want you to see is that Mary's song of praise is full of Scripture. Mary's song of praise is full of Scripture. You see, don't you, in, in, in this song that she begins to sing to the Lord in verses 46 through 55. It is, as we would say, chopped full of Scripture. Here is Mary, the young virgin, who has now entered into the house of Elizabeth, and she breaks out in praise, what the Pentecostals would call a praise break. She, she breaks out in praise because of what Elizabeth has said to her. You notice it there in verse 43, don't you? That as, that as Mary enters the, wound, Elizabeth, the room with the baby in her womb, verse 43, Elizabeth responds, 
Why am I deserving for the mother of my Savior to enter into my presence? You see, here it is that Elizabeth is acknowledging that Mary is indeed carrying in her womb Jesus, her Lord and Savior, and the thought of it overwhelms Mary. Therefore, she pours out this song of praise to her God, and and as she does it, as her lips begin to move, it is filled with verse after verse, phrase after phrase with Scripture. You know, here it is that, that Mary models for us how, how our minds to be saturated with the Word of God. If you just know your Old Testament well, you, you, you hear Psalm 103 being mentioned, and Psalm 22, and Psalm 44, and Psalm 89, and Psalm 98, and Psalm 147. You, you hear Hannah's song from 1 Samuel chapter 2 as, as Hannah is promised Samuel, her own child. But not only is she referencing and alluding to 1 Samuel, but she alludes to 2 Samuel. And then she moves into the prophets of Isaiah. And then she moves into the book of Job. You you, you see, don't you, how, how as Mary begins to pray and to sing and to give thanksgiving to God, it is full of Scripture. Which, which leads you to understand that that Mary is so familiar with her Bible that as her lips begin to sing praises to God, the only thing that she can recount to herself is God's words in the Old Testament. And so as her heart begins to to be overwhelmed in praise and worship, as her lips begin to sing praises to the Lord, as she begins to express her feelings of thankfulness. It is all in the language of the Bible. And and, and you think about that. It is the Scripture who helps her cope with the news from Gabriel. And now it is the Scripture that helps her face these, these despairing circumstances of her life. She is so overwhelmed with praise even in the midst of her circumstance She doesn't know if Joseph is going to divorce her. She doesn't know if her community is going to exclude her. She doesn't know if her immediate family is going to ridicule her and and disclaim her. And yet, at the same time, she's giving thanksgiving back to God full of Scripture. Because it it is this Scripture that helps her realize that despite the circumstances that she's facing, she will be blessed by her Lord. The Scripture here, her knowledge of the Scripture here, enables her to believe. It enables her to press on. It enables her to respond in faith. And and of course, this is an example to us, isn't it? She's she's modeling for us a a mind that is so saturated in, in the Scripture's that, that it's the only place that she turns to in her times of trouble. I heard one pastor say, I've already used his language, but I heard one pastor ask his congregation a question many uh, months ago as I was looking at Psalms of Lament this past summer, and he asked the question, how do you react when you're on autopilot? And so you, you think about a crisis that you've had in your life and and, and the news has broken in such a way you're not even given the opportunity to think how am I going to navigate these waves I'm just reacting I'm just doing in the midst of my trouble And, and how do you react when your life goes on autopilot like that well of course as we see here Mary is in one of those instances and and she is in autopilot because you think about it The angel has come to her and says, you're going to bear a child. His name will be Jesus. He'll be the forgiver of sins. No time to think, right? Now she's in in the house of Elizabeth, her cousin, and Elizabeth is proclaiming and underlining the fact you are carrying in your womb the Messiah. And and all of a sudden, that, that same feeling of being overwhelmed and that same feeling of needing to react happens And and how do you react when things in your life take you by surprise? 
Well, I think that we should be like Mary who only respond with Scripture-saturated minds. That we need to be like Mary and, and react in scriptural ways. And, and that's what Mary first models for us here with this song. A mind that is full of Scripture, a song that is full of Scripture. But you see, the second thing I hope, that as we read together, you see that Mary's song was full of humility. So it's full of Scripture first, but it's also full of humility. You especially see that in verses 46 through 48 of her song. Because here it is that Mary has been given a, an honorable position within the redemptive story. You, you think about it. Here is Mary who is the Messiah bearer. Here is Mary who is carrying the Christ child all the way back at Genesis 3. You remember as Adam and Eve fell into sin, as they are being outcast from the garden, as they are being told, here is the judgment due to you for your sin, God presents the gospel for the first time. And He tells them there in Genesis 3.15 that, that from the line of a woman, from the seed of a woman, there will be one who will come and He will crush the head of the serpent. And that promised Messiah is now in the womb of Mary. And so in this story, Mary is one that, that we could celebrate. That, that, that is one that has a very important role even within our salvation. And it would, would have been quite easy for Mary to go, boy, aren't I something? I don't even know if that was proper English, to be honest with you. But aren't I something? Look at me. I am the one who's carrying the Savior. I am the one who is going to deliver the child who will be the promised Messiah, who will forgive the sins of His people. I am the one. This is my greatest moment. It is the greatest moment in all of history. You see, she could have been taken this significant status that she has been given and she could, she could fluff herself up and, and, and stand boldly before Elizabeth and say, you know what, Elizabeth, you are right. I'm too good to even be in this home. And, and yet, she doesn't respond in that way. She responds in humility. And, and you see it here in the, those verses, verses 46 through 48. There's actually two ways it, that shows us her humility. And, and the first one is she, she counts herself as a sinner. You see that there in verse 47? She says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Here it is that Mary says, the, 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 the Christ child that I'm carrying in my womb, the one who will be the Savior of His people, even me as the instrument of delivering that Savior, I am the one that needs that Savior. I'm a sinner. I, I need to be forgiven. I need my sins atoned for. The Savior of the world is also my Savior. And in the same way, in verse 48, she says that she is a willing servant of the Lord, for He has regard for the humble state of His servant. You see, she is, she is bringing herself down low to, to show us a model of, of humility. And quite frankly, beloved, humility is one of those things that, that is a sign of grace working in your heart. It's a, it's a grace for us to be a people who are humble because our humility is often tested. You, you think about it. If, if you are given a position at work where you have power and authority in that office or in that region, you, you can take that and you can say, look at me. Look at all the good things I've done. And, and, and yet the Scriptures call us as, as Christians to be ones that are humble. But it might not even be a, a, a job promotion or a job title in and of itself. It might be you during the Christmas season are trying to, trying to serve the church or serve one another. And all of a sudden your service isn't going recognized and you think... <laughs> I've done all this and this and this. You know, I've decorated the Christmas trees and, and, and I've mopped the floors and I've delivered fruitcakes. 
and all the sorts, and nobody wants to give me credit. You see, humility is tested. Humility is often tested within this life, especially within this season, and it's, and it's easy to, to puff ourselves up and to demand that, that people respect us and demand that people count us as, as worthy of their praise. And here is Mary. Here's Mary humbling herself before Elizabeth and her Lord. Humbling herself before other people and her Savior. And, and, and it's, an, it's an important emphasis, I think, that, that we see Mary's humility in her song. We see her emphasis on Scripture. We see her emphasis on humility. And then also we see, thirdly, that her song is full of thanksgiving. We've already alluded to this in our first point, but if you look at verses 46 through 49 especially, you see over and over and over again that, that Mary, being one that has humbled herself before the Lord, she is giving thanks to the Lord for the marvelous things that she has been able to do through His will. And so she says, My soul exalts in the Lord, for He has... Regard for my humble estate. For behold, from this time on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has exalted those who are humble. He has filled the hungry. He has given help to Israel. He remembers his mercy all through this song. She is filled with thanksgiving, this this attitude of thankfulness. And I think we need to think about this for a moment because here is Mary. Again, you think about the circumstances. Single, unwed, in a culture that doesn't look favorably upon these things. And yet, her eyes are not to her circumstances that would cause her to be full of despair. But again, she is focused upon the Lord. The goodness of the Lord, the grace of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, the provision of the Lord. And, and she cannot help but to be thankful that all these circumstances, no matter how bleak they look to the human eye, are marvelous before the servant of the Lord. And she is indeed thankful. And it is a challenge for us, I think, to, to cultivate, to to work on this kind of thankfulness even in our own spirit. I love what J.C. Ryle says. He, said, he says, Let us rise from our beds every morning with a deep conviction that we are debtors and that every day we have more mercies than we deserve. You see, if you understand that every morning, you will understand a, a spirit, a heart of thankfulness. That we are given more mercies than we ever could deserve. You know, it would have been real easy for Mary to focus on her circumstances. It would have been real easy for Mary to be just weighed down with all of her despairing facts that are going on in her life, all the, all the questions that her soul is asking, and, and yet she focuses only upon the Lord. Just to underline the, the, the despairing details of this story, for Mary, you even ask yourself, why is Mary leaving her family and going away to visit Elizabeth for three months? She's far off. This isn't just jumping in a car and, and driving six hours to go visit a cousin. This is a hard journey for Mary to get to Elizabeth's home. This, this is a... A, a hard journey for Mary to do as she is pregnant and especially as she waits three months to return home. Is it that her immediate family has responded like Joseph with unbelief? Is it that her immediate family is trying to hide her from her community and maybe even her synagogue so that she might not be ridiculed and excluded? We don't know. We're not given those details. But you, you see that there is something going on here in the life of Mary for her even to be at the house of Elizabeth. And, and yet she's not discouraged by these things. She is given over to thankfulness in her Lord. You see, 
As one pastor said, true gospel thankfulness is always a matter of faith over circumstance. True gospel thankfulness is always a matter of faith over circumstance. It's a matter of seeing our circumstances through the eyes of our faith. There was an African American evangelist by the name of E.V. Hill who said that since the day of his conversion as a young boy, he would always wake up and even before his head was lifted from the pillow, he would say, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, in every circumstance, thank you Jesus. And that's Mary's response in this very difficult situation, isn't it? That she models in her song a praise an attitude of thankfulness. And so we have full of Scripture, we have full of humility, we have full of thankfulness, and then finally and fourthly, we have full of experience. And now let me, un- let me unpack what I mean there. Because here in our text, as, as Mary continues to, to pour out this, this powerful song of praise, she begins to recall, doesn't she, the the mercy that that has been given to her and to God's people in the past. You see, she she begins, doesn't she, in in, in verse 50 and, and all the way through the end of her song in verse 55, she begins to to recall what the Lord has done for the sake of his people. And that includes her. And and as she's recalling these things, as she is as she's returning thanks and, and, and giving praise to God for these things, she, she has a clue on how God is going to deal with her now in the future. You, you see it, don't you? It's from generation to generation, you have shown your mercy. From Abraham to now, you have shown favor and given victory. All of these things she can, she can hold on to and she can cling to it as, as the gospel truth that you have done this in the past and now you will do it For me, again. You know, here it is that Mary's song of praise, I believe, gives us a a glimpse into the importance of of truly experiencing the goodness of the Lord. Because when we have experienced the goodness of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, the the favor of the Lord, it it drives us to, to trust in His dealings for the future. Don't you see it? It's one of the great things or great ways that we, that we deal with hard circumstances in our own lives. We, we cling to the experience of God. Here's Mary looking back and seeing how God has dealt with her and her people in the past. He's spoken to them. He's rescued them. He's aided them. He's taught them. And Mary takes those truths and she says, you've done it from generation to generation. You've done it for me and now you will do it for me again. You know, here it is that Mary's song is filled with the recounting of this. And it's there in verse 50. His mercy is upon generation after generation. From generation to generation... You have been merciful, and you will be merciful with me again. Here is, again, a a young teenage girl who is vulnerable in the circumstances that she is dealing with, and, and, and yet she is confident in her Lord. And why can she be so confident in Him? Because she has seen. She has experienced the victory that comes with her Lord already in the past and she is already anticipating that victory that will come for her in the future. You know, here it is that I think that Mary challenges us to to learn to, to lay hold to Bible promises. You know, we need to learn how to grasp Bible promises. I heard one pastor say, we walk by faith, but faith leans on the promises of the Scripture. And those promises of the Scripture will bear all the weight that we can lay upon them. We may lean on them confidently. Here it is that Mary understands that that God in His covenant faithfulness has been good to His people. 
He has delivered His people. He has spoken to His people. He has aided His people. He has sustained His people. And here it is that in her moment of praise, she, she lays hold to those Bible promises and, and essentially prays, do it again, Lord. Confidently knowing that He will do it. And so here it is that, that we see this song that is full of confidence, that is full of experience, that is full of thankfulness, that is full of Scripture, that is full of humility, and you think, here is a beautiful song, and, and there's no wonder why we read it each and every Christmas. It's been a song that has been sung and recited and read through generations to generations to remind us of these things, and yet, understand this, if you don't believe it, it means nothing. You, you, you see, don't you, that, that if we are to be the ones who are challenged to be full of Scripture, if we are the ones to be challenged to, bull, to be full of humility and full of thankfulness and even full of experience, we have to lay hold to even these Bible promises that are, that are declared to us right here in this song that God will be merciful to us, that God will sustain us, that God will bring us victory just as He has before. And so you ask yourself the question, do I believe this? Do I believe what Mary has, has declared here in her powerful song of praise? Do I have personal faith in, in this Jesus in whom she declares that is good and merciful and the Savior of sinners. You see, beloved, when we come into the courts of the Lord during the Advent season, it, we are declaring that Advent is about trusting. Trusting in the Messiah who came. Trusting in the One who came and took upon Himself human flesh. The One who came and put Himself under the law and in fact obeyed perfectly, and yet died the sinner's death in the place of His people, so that all who call upon His name and faith and repentance might be saved. Advent is about trusting, but it's also about waiting. Don't you see that as Mary anticipates the future during Advent, we also anticipate the future. And so Advent is about trusting, yes, but it's about waiting as well, waiting for that same Messiah to come again in glory, to give victory to His people forevermore, to make all things new, to make all sad things come untrue. We, we wait upon the Lord for the full consummation of our joy and our peace. I can go full circle here and go back to a social media post that I saw over the weekend. I understand that my opening and closing illustrations have been social media posts. Blame it on me being a millennial. There was a, a social media post by a fellow PCA pastor that, that said this, Advent is not just four weeks of Christmas. It is rather a season of hopeful aching and watchful waiting amidst the very conditions, depravity, disease, division, despair, and death that made Christmas necessary at all. It's a season of hopeful aching and watchful waiting amidst the very conditions of this fallen world that made Christmas necessary at all. You know, as I read that post, it caused me to think of those lyrics in that Christmas hymn, O Holy Night, that simply state the thrill of hope the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Do you know that thrill of hope that is, that is found only in Jesus Christ? Do you have faith in Him? Have you trusted Him despite your circumstances? Have you worshipped Him? And the challenge here is for us all to be like Mary. And may we humbly declare that the Lord has done good things even in the midst of this fallen world, and first and foremost, He has given us Jesus. And would you come to Him in faith and repentance. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen.
It's good for us to respond to the reading and preaching of God's Word with singing. So if you'll take out those bulletins again or those pew Bibles as you feel comfortable. Our hymn of response is hymn 200. It came upon a midnight clear and we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Please stand as you are able. that we have a congregational meeting uh, right after the postlude. If you uh, are a member here and would like to be excused, please do so uh, during the postlude after the congregational response. Now receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 